Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured, but the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. In part one of Thus Spoke Zarathustra, one theme that Friedrich Nietzsche brings up quite a bit, and it straddles several of the sections, is that of solitude. What is it to have genuine solitude? What is it to be a solitary person? And in German, the word for solitude is Einsamkeit, being literally Einsam, uh, on one's own, right? And it can be translated as solitude, which is a, a generally a positive connotation to it. It can also be translated as loneliness. And this is a great theme running throughout literature prior to Nietzsche and also taken up by other people after him. There is a conception in which solitude is something necessary for us as human beings in order to develop and grow. So we can't be entirely what we ought to be or what we're capable of being if we're taking all of our cues from other people or from society and not from our own, not just experience, but our own reflections on and our own engagement in that experience, which may not be shared and in some respects cannot be shared with other people. So the solitary person is in certain respects, um, a strange creature, and, and they're felt to be strange, as we see in the uh, discussion of the flies of the marketplace, by all the other people who seem to be much better socialized. There's a possibility of going too far with socialization, we could say, so that a person lacks what we call an interior life. But this is an interior life that is also oriented towards the exterior, that sees more than the other people do. So the, the two sections that really come out as particularly important are, as I mentioned, the of the flies in the marketplace, and then the section that just preceded it, which is about the development and the extent of the state called of the new idol. There Nietzsche mentions that the solitary person is the one who can escape this dynamic created by the state. So Nietzsche thinks that this is something that we, we absolutely need, but it's made incredibly difficult by modern society. There are so many temptations, so many assaults upon our solitude. And I'll just give you one as an example of our own time that Nietzsche himself, you know, could have imagined but didn't have to experience. And that is whenever you go into public spaces these days, if they can afford it, there is a television blaring, you know, usually set right in the middle of things so that it draws your eyes and it's tuned into either the news or some stupid talk show or some, you know, kind of low, low key drama, something to, to just keep people occupied and have, you know, talking heads, chattering at each other the entire time. And that makes it difficult. I, I often go in carrying a book and find myself having trouble concentrating, uh, you know, at, at, for example, a doctor's office on what's in the book because of this, this, you know, constant chattering of the television personalities. And I look around and I see people's eyes glued to the set. Um, that would be a prime example and sort of a symbol of the lack of solitude. Why the hell would you put televisions everywhere? Because it's going to make people's lives better. It's going to give them something to do. Wouldn't it be better 
for them to actually sit with their own thoughts for a while. That's what Nietzsche would say. But most people are actually not capable. Or if, they're, if they are capable, they choose not to be with their own thoughts and ideas and feelings and reflections and memories. And they don't cultivate this, this solitude. So Nietzsche talks about the state and society within it. I'm just going to uh, highlight a few passages from this, he talks about the state as being the place for superfluous people. It manages even to suck in the better, the higher people and, you know, give them a sort of devil's bargain of we're going to make you famous. We're going to give you power. We're going to, uh, you know, make the, the ordinary people look up to you and you just have to, you know, follow the rules of the state. You'll be domesticated, so to speak, and everything will go great. Now, Nietzsche says um, the, the state is a place where everyone, good and bad, is a poison drinker. The state where everyone, good and bad, loses themselves. The state where universal slow suicide is called life. And then he talks about, you know, culture, Bildung in German. He talks about the newspapers, so the media. He talks about wealth and people's obsession with it. And then he says, see them clamber, these nimble apes, they clamber over one another and so scuffle into the mud and into the abyss. And he says, this seems like madmen and clambering apes and too vehement. Their idol, the cold monster, um, is the state. And he says, do you want to suffocate in the fumes of this? No, better to break the window and leap into the open air. Better to seek out a space of solitude for oneself. He says... The earth still remains free for great souls. Many places, the odor of tranquil seas blowing about them are still empty. And here he talks about solitaries and solitary couples, which could be, you know, some sort of, you know, romantic pairing, or it could be friends, or it could be perhaps even enemies who uh, can, can recognize the right kind of enemy in, in the other person or rivals, we might say. But they, they leave the state and the society behind them. And the questions that we could ask ourselves is, does this have to mean going out into some foreign place that's been unsettled? Not a lot of those left these days. In the much uh, longer and in-depth discussion about the marketplace, Nietzsche brings up the need for solitude as well. And he says, flee into your solitude. I see you deafened by the uproar of the great men and pricked by the stings of the small ones. So again, we see the same dynamic, this, this distinction of the great people and they are doing one thing and then there's the many, the, the, the small people, and they're also doing something as well. So he tells us that in this world, the world of the marketplace, even the best things are worthless apart from him who first presents them. People call these presenters great men. What would be some examples of this? Well, think about all the people who we idolize because they came up with a new business model. And we say, oh my God, they're coming to town. We'd better go to their, their presentation. Oh, they've got a new blog post out. Oh, a new video. I'd better check up on this person or this person. They are what Nietzsche would call the, the great men in this case, or great people. They're looked up to because they brought in some, some new gimmick. Some new shtick. Very often it's not even original. You know, you see this in, in business and you see this in education and you see this in policing and you see this in all these other fields. People kind of recycle old ideas and give them a new twist and change the colors on the PowerPoint presentation. And suddenly they've come up with a wonderful new plan, right? Um, and, and, you know, a lot of it has to do with marketing and, and with, uh, finding, you know, ways to appeal to people. You know, nowadays we talk about life hacks. We'll talk about the same stupid thing uh, in different words 10 years down the line, right? And people are tired of life hacks already. We're already coming up with new things for that. All of that is what Nietzsche would call the great men, and they're not really great. They're just recognized as being great within the marketplace. And that deafens us. They're on TV all the time, these celebrities, these people who are viewed as actually having something to say. And it infects even intellectual life. 
You can go to conferences and hear the hushed tones as this person, oh my God, I can't believe that they're here and they're going to do a talk. They put on their pants the same way that all the rest of us do, one leg at a time, sometimes tripping and slipping into the falling on the floor, right? So that's, that's what he's calling the great men. Then, of course, there's the little people and he calls them the flies, and he's using that as sort of a metaphor. What kind of flies? The kind of flies that swarm around on crap? No, the biting, stinging flies. If you've ever been out, say, uh, camping near a lake and you had deer flies biting you, they're actually putting their, they're not actually biting into you, they're actually putting their uh, liquid, their digestive juices onto you, onto your skin. Kind of hurts, right? Um, and we could think about other insects that suck our blood and, and make us weaker, ticks, you know, vermin of, of that sort. So he says, um, the marketplace is full of solemn buffoons and the people boast of their great men. These are the heroes of the hour. Um, they're made so by the little people. And he says that, um, I see you stung by poisonous flies. Flee into your solitude then. You've lived too near the small and the pitiable men. Flee from their hidden vengeance. Now, why does Nietzsche talk about hidden vengeance here? Because even though the weak will and the small will make some people into big people, they really hate them. They wish they could be like them. They, they don't have the forces, the capacity to do that. So they're constantly stinging and detracting. And if you're not willing to play their game, like the big men are, the big people who, you know, will sign the autographs and bask in the applause and, you know, say stupid things so that they can have approval. Uh, you know, here, here's another thing. Nietzsche says, a truth that penetrates only sensitive ears this person of the marketplace calls a lie and a thing of nothing, right? So if you're actually telling the real truth about things, the ordinary people are not going to reward you for that. They are going to dislike you. They want things made simple. A theme we'll come back to in a moment, but let's stick with the flies theme. He says, innumerable are these small and pitiable men and raindrops and weeds have already brought about the destruction of many a proud building. If you're not careful, they will bring you down with a little bit here and a little bit there and a little bit here and a zinger here and one more thing that you have to deal with. He says, you're not a stone. These drops have already made you hollow. You're not made of iron. They will eventually tear you down if you don't go into solitude. He says, they're innumerable and it's not your fate to be a fly swatter. It's not your job to try to ward off all of these. Go somewhere else where you can, in fact, enjoy solitude. Going on a little bit more, he says, they want blood from you in all innocence. Their bloodless souls thirst for it. You suffer too profoundly even from small wounds. And before you have recovered, the same poison worm is crawling over your hand. You're too proud to kill these sweet-toothed creatures, but take care it does not become your fate to bear all their poisonous injustice. You should push back, but realize that you can never push back against all of them. And the more that you're exposed by being in the marketplace, by being, for example, in social media, opening yourself up to the entire world, the greater the danger is that all those little pricks and stings and and, you know, criticisms will, in fact, bring you down, sap your vital powers. He says, um, here we go. They think about you a great deal with their narrow souls. You're always suspicious to them. Everything that's thought about a great deal is finally thought suspicious. They will punish you for your virtues. Fundamentally, they forgive you only, what? Your mistakes. Because your mistakes make you more like them. And then they can feel okay because it's, oh, he or she's not that great at all. Another aspect of this that I said we'd come back to, there's, Nietzsche frames it in terms of these demands of saying yes or no, being for and against, declaring yourself on all sorts of trivial and misunderstood matters. Are you a Democrat or a Republican? Which candidate are you going to support? What if you say, well, both of them are crap? 
And both of these parties are awful. Perhaps one is more awful than the other, but they're both a big mess of problems. Oh, well then, you know, you're, you're going to be attacked, right? Because you don't fit in nicely. Or now we have actually the centrists where they, they can be their own thing. Uh, but you have to be a centrist in the right way. And we can go on and on and on. It could be music. It could be religion. It could be art forms. It could be whether the tech revolution is good or bad. It could be whatever the, the object of the day is in terms of the thing that everybody is talking about. You should have a position. You should have some way of staking out which side you belong to. Now, the, the solitary person, the thinking person, is not really going to want to do that. They're going to want to pause and say, well, I, I think I need to get more information. No, you need to take a stand right now for or against. I'll give you another example of this from social media. How often when you criticize somebody or, or something on one side of an issue, does everybody assume that because of that, you're entirely committed to the other side of the issue? If you criticize capitalism, you must be a communist. If you criticize communism, you must be one of those capitalist running dogs and on and on and on. That's because they are stuck in that binary, oversimplistic thinking that works well for what, what Nietzsche is calling the marketplace. He says, you're a bad conscience to your neighbor. They're unworthy of you. That's why they hate you and would dearly like to suck your blood. You show them up. You show them that there's greater possibility for human beings than what they're showing. Now, where is solitude possible? Nietzsche begins this section by talking about nature. He says, forest and rock know well how to be silent with you. Be like the tree again, the wide branching tree that you love. Calmly and attentively, it leans out to the sea. And indeed, nature is one place where I think many people can attain solitude, but it couldn't, it doesn't have to just be that. We could attain solitude in the heart of the city, looking at the concrete structures that maybe are not covered entirely with advertisement and screens, you know, blaring uh, words and lessons and enticements out to us, but just looking at the architecture itself, looking at the sidewalk. Nature is also present within the urbanized world. Find parks. Look at the grass growing through the cracks of the sidewalk. Sometimes even you know, on on-ramps. I've seen that in New Jersey getting onto the highway where grass uh, either had been allowed to, to run riot or it was so strong that you could actually see it on the on-ramp driving up onto the freeway. There is all sorts of possibilities and places where we can have solitude. It's more about shifting our mentality and recognizing for Nietzsche the dangers that are out there. He also talks about the possibility of shared solitude. And this comes up again in that of the new idol where he, he says that, um, you know, many places are still empty for solitaries, individual solitaries, and for solitary couples. And the question that you would have to ask is, well, is this them sharing the exact same solitude or are they both, in fact, solitudes? And then they share a greater solitude with each other. And to understand that, I think it's, it's good to take a look at the section of the friend. And I'll just mention this very quickly because it deserves its own treatment separately. Um, Nietzsche talks about the, the hermit in this case. The hermit is somebody who goes off into the wilderness and chooses a life of solitude. And for, he says, for the hermit, the friend is always the third person. Why? Because the hermit is having a conversation with him or herself. And then the friend comes in as another person. Um, he says that the third person is the cork that prevents the conversation from sinking into the depths. For the hermit, there are actually too many depths. And this is why they, they need a friend and their heights. So perhaps... Solitude is something that if we don't have 
somebody else to share it with. We have to endure on our own, and it's better than being in the marketplace or the state and society that goes with it. But if we have the possibility of finding another who recognizes the value of solitude, we can share solitude together. For Nietzsche, this is going to be something absolutely necessary, something absolutely needed for a human being to fully develop. 